in July 2022, the Supreme Court published their judgment in the case of Brazil versus Harper Trust. This case concerned holiday entitlement under the Working Time Regulations 1998. In this video, taken from our recent employment law update on the 18th of October, myself, Libby Hubbard, the professional support lawyer at Anthony Collins, and Anna de Beck, who is our head of employment and pensions team also at Anthony Collins, we discuss the ramifications and details of this decision. Well, good morning, everyone, and good morning, Anna. Morning, Libby. So the topic that we're going to just discuss between us, we thought it might break up the morning, relates to the Supreme Court hearing. Uh, it was the Harper Trust versus Brazil. I'm sure quite a few of you will have heard of it. And the Supreme Court produced their decision in July earlier this year, so July 2022, when some of us were lucky enough to be on holiday, the judgment finally landed and we've been waiting for it for some time. And whenever we talk about holidays in employment, we're usually talking either about holiday entitlement or holiday pay. But in this case, the Harper Brazil case, we got a bargain because we got both of them. So, Anna, can we just recap? Can I get you just to fill us in on some of the details of the case? Yeah, of course. So, um, the case, as the title suggests, uh, concerns an employee called uh, Miss Brazel, who was a music teacher um, in a school owned by Halpert Trust. And um, she was a visiting music teacher. She provided music lessons to um, pupils. Uh, she was employed under a permanent continuous contract of employment. Um, very important fact to remember. So it was a permanent uh, contract of employment. Um, but what is also important is that she did not have a set number of hours each week. Uh, she only worked during term time, uh, which on average worked out about 30 to 35 weeks per year. And she was therefore described in the case as a part year employee her hours were also dependent on how many pupils were learning to play um, musical instruments and so her hours during the uh, weeks where she worked uh, varied um, and that is a, a, another important uh, fact in this um, case uh, what I would highlight specifically is that based on these facts, the Court of Appeal judge, and this was not disputed in the Supreme Court, specifically stated that Ms. Brazel was employed on what he called a permanent zero hours contract. Okay, so that's a really good background. So what we're getting, what this case is therefore relevant, we know it's not just schools, even though the case here was about a music teacher in a school who was on a term time part year contract. This case actually widens beyond the education sector and is applicable to anybody who has staff on zero hours permanent contracts, i.e. in between their periods of work, they are still employed. Is that where we're heading, Anna? Exactly. Exactly. This case effectively applies to uh, or is relevant uh, to um, what many of our clients would uh, call permanent zero hour employees. Um, so to return to the facts of the case, Ms. Brazel was uh, required to take her annual leave during the uh, school holiday days, i.e. when she was not working and she was off, off work. And the trust worked out her holiday pay um, in the following way. They paid her three times a year, so in three installments, at the end of each term. And this is something that employers often um, refer to as rolled up holiday pay. Uh, so effectively, an individual is not taking their holiday and they are simply paid in lieu of the holiday for a specific period of time. And the way they worked out the 
pay at the end of each term was basically by paying Mrs. Ms. Brazel, sorry, 12.7% uh, of her earnings for that term. Um, and many of the clients uh, on this seminar will be very familiar with this calculation. It is a commonly used holiday pay calculation method, or, or I should probably say it was a commonly used holiday pay uh, calculation method for um, those who are employed on zero hours or variable hours contracts. Okay, so if we can just back up there for anybody who's not familiar with that 12.07% calculation, it's essentially the figure that you arrive at by working out the percentage of 5.6 weeks, so that's the paid holiday allocation under the working time regulations, you then divide that by 46.4, so that's the 52 weeks in the year minus the 5.6, so 5.6 divided by 46.4 as a percentage um, is 12.07. So that's how we get at that 12.07%, but I'm sure most of you will um, be aware of that calculation. But as Anna has pointed to, Miss Brazel, well, and most probably her union, Unison, who were joined in the proceedings, said, no, actually, this way of calculating is not right. I'm not getting paid enough. And more importantly, it's not compliant with the working time regulations. I should be getting more. Is that right, Anna? Keep keep going. Yeah, yeah, yeah that, <laughs> that is exactly right. Uh, so Ms. Brazel, or as you say, her union, argued that she didn't accrue enough holiday pay under the 12.7% calculation. She basically pointed out that she was entitled to 5.6 weeks holiday a year, which is what the uh, statutory amount is under the working um, time regulations, and that this should be calculated effectively by working out her average weekly pay for the year and then multiplying it by 5.6, i.e. 5.6 weeks holiday times an average weekly uh, pay. And this uh, calculation method proposed by um, Unison, Ms. Brazil, effectively resulted in greater holiday pay entitlement than the one that she was receiving. So let's presume that Ms. Brazil, say she worked 33 weeks a year, so she worked 11 weeks in each academic term. Let's again presume, because it makes it easier, that each of those weeks she earned £100. So her rolled up holiday pay at the end of each term, using the 12.07% calculation, would be 11 times 100 times 12.07%, which would get us to £132.77 per term, which is £398.31 per year. Okay, in total. But using Ms. Brazel's method of calculation, if her average weekly pay, as we've said, was 100, then her holiday pay for the year would be that much more. It would be £560 because it's 5.6 holiday entitlement, weekly holiday entitlement under the working time regulations times 100. Based on those calculations, Ms. Brazel brought a claim for unlawful deduction of wages. She argued that no, the, the trust method using the 12.07% meant she was a couple of hundred pounds out of pocket for her holiday pay. And that obviously wasn't permitted under the working time regulations. So that was the tenet of her claim. Yeah, that, that's exactly right. Um, Libby. Uh, the trust, on the other hand, argued that Ms. Brazel's suggested method of calculation would effectively equate to 17.5% of annual um, earnings, and then this would be unfair towards other uh, employees who worked throughout the, the year. Effectively, the trust argued that holidays should be proratted based on the number of weeks that Ms. Brazel works during the, the year. And um, as she worked less weeks and less hours, um, she should be entitled to less holiday than a full-time uh, uh, worker. 
I think what is really, really interesting, and it um, highlights the point that you were making, is during the submissions, the trust gave an example showing how disproportionate Ms. Brazel's method of calculating holiday could be. Um, and again, I'm going to read here from the judgment. Um, uh, the, 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 the submission that was made by Harper Trust, they effectively said, in principle, you could have a permanent employee who worked only one week of the year for which she or he earned, let's say, £1,000 and who would then be entitled to 5.6 weeks annual leave for which they would receive £5,600, i.e. 5 Point six times the average weekly earnings of thousand pounds. As for the purposes of holiday pay calculations, you need to discount any weeks where the employee has not earned any wage. So this is just, uh, you know, it, it just shows how ludicrous it is. Yeah, sorry, I was about to jump in there. And they go, that just sounds <laughs> well. To coin a legal phrase, bonkers, isn't it? It sounds unfair and also unsustainable for employers to have to um, keep paying such a, such a high amount for holiday when those um, employees aren't working all year round. So what did the Supreme Court say? Did we know what the Court of Appeal said? Did the Supreme Court say, yes, you're right, um, the 12.07% is incompatible with the working time regulation? Where did they fall on it? Unfortunately, for those that do engage um, zero hour uh, workers or term, term time only workers, both the Court of Appeal and subsequently the Supreme Court in uh, July when the judgment was um, uh, was published, agreed with Ms. Brazel. Um, so first, in 2019, the Court of Appeal held that Ms. Brazel was entitled to holiday leave of 5.6 weeks, even though she would be entitled to a much higher percentage of her, uh, of, of her salary if paid for 5.6 weeks of holiday when compared to a full-time employee. And the Court of Appeal noted that it effectively um, uh, the, 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 the trust method of calculation would be not compliant with working time regulations because the working time regulations don't permit for a, a holiday to be prorated in these sort of circumstances. And in essence, the Supreme Court uh, agreed with that. They dismiss uh, Mrs. Ms. Brazel's uh, appeal and uh, effectively, sorry, the Harper Trust appeal and effectively agreed with the decision in favour of Ms. Harper. Okay, and it's probably just worth noting there that in its judgment, the Supreme Court specifically confirmed that the case was relevant to workers who work varying hours during only certain weeks of the year, but have a continuing contract. So for employers in other sectors, that was a real confirmation that this case went wider than the education sector. Yeah. That is correct. Effectively, this judgment therefore impacts on a much wider group of employees than just term time workers and could have significant uh, significant financial co consequences for any employer who offers zero hour um, contracts. I am very aware and before uh, people get really uh, frustrated that this decision seems unfair and the outcome reach can hardly have been parliament's intentions but as the court of appeal and the supreme court noted there is no mechanism within the working time regulations to pro rata holiday entitlement in the way that harper trust suggested so it's probably the supreme court felt their hands were tied by the existing drafting of the working time regulations. If I can just put in there for anybody who's thinking, but what about part-time workers? So what about part-time workers who work regular hours all year round? Does this judgment affect them? Well, it's worth reassuring anybody who's thinking of that question that holiday entitlement can be pro-rated for part-time workers who have 
regular working hours. So say, for example, if you have a member of staff or several members of staff who work Tuesday to Friday, say four days a week, they would be entitled still even post this judgment to 22.4 days a holiday as compared with the 28 days paid holiday under working time. This is because 22.4 days holiday entitlement would result in the same holiday pay as in if you did the calculation times 5.6 because they're only working for part of the week. So that's just one point of com comfort from this, that part-time workers on regular hours will not be affected by this judgment. Yeah, thanks Libby. That is um, that is a, 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 good, a good point and a good explanation. Um, I, I think really the decision impacts on three categories of workers. Uh, employees who work term time only, or under other agreements where they are working fewer weeks than the standard working year. Permanent employees with no fixed working hours, so uh, those effectively employed on a zero hours contract. And finally, it may also affect uh, casual workers, bank workers, relief workers, whatever a specific organization whole, uh, uh, calls them, but basically it's workers who are given ad hoc work only and are not on, on permanent continuous employment uh, arrangements. Okay, so we've got those three, three different illustrations. And I guess the question that flows from this really complex case, and we've spent some time talking about the complexities, but what we always like to do, and those of you who follow our blogs or our e-briefs, quick plug there, if you don't, please do sign up. We always like to finish off with, okay, so what are the learning points? What does this actually mean? What, I, what should I be doing in my business? How do I ensure that my organization is following the Supreme Court judgment and I'm not facing a whole ream of unlawful deduction of wages claims? So Anna, I'm going to put you on the spot. Can I ask you as we kind of finish off here, what are the practical applications for this and what, what are we going to be advising our clients and have been advising clients to do in light of the Supreme Court decision? I'll try my very best, although it's not straightforward. And um, so I think it is worth highlighting that there could be a huge number of claims for holiday uh, pay that has not been paid historically, as the 12.7 calculation method has been used, used widely. And in fact, uh, was uh, the method that uh, was recommended um, by the government and in uh, various government and ACAS guidance. Um, employees could bring claims in the employment tribunals and county courts with the potential liability in county courts going uh, back six years. So as I say, it could be significant. I do think that claims for historic liability are more likely uh, where workforce is unionized. So I think for those employers that uh, are uh, unionized, I, I probably would be more cautious about what I do going forward and would definitely um, seek legal advice. In terms of practical steps that employers can take, I think the first step, in my view, would be to identify which, which staff are affected and carry out a review of how holiday pay is calculated at the moment to understand understand uh, whether you are or not compliant and also what your potential level of liability is. I think as part of that review, I would also suggest looking at working arrangements more generally and assessing whether all zero hour colleagues are categorized appropriately. Um, and what I mean by that is, are they permanent zero hours contracts or are they in fact casual workers um, and either set up uh, correctly in terms of contractual paperwork that, that follows. Uh, effectively, miscategorizing employees could lead to otherwise avoidable holiday uh, calculation issues. I think what is really frustrating is that despite the opinion of the Court of Appeal and the, the Supreme Court, a court that calculating holiday pay was a straightforward exercise. Effectively, you identify a week's pay, you multiply it by 5.6, and there you go. There is your, your holiday uh, pay. And um, 
that in reality it is much more difficult for uh, employers who engage colleagues on irregular or zero hour contracts where there are no contractual hours uh, hours are not regular and holiday ta isn't taken in weeks but is in fact taken in in days or or hours I think the good news is that there are a number of possible solutions uh, to difficulties posed by this decision. However, because of the lack of clarity in the working time regulations and the lack of clear domestic case law in this area, the options available will unfortunately very much depend on employers' particular working arrangements, your written terms and conditions of employment and your appetite to um, risk. I would therefore, obviously I'm going to say it, but I would therefore strongly suggest seeking, seeking specific legal uh, advice. In terms of the uh, range of options available, uh, you know, some of our clients are taking a very commercial decision. They are deciding to continue to uh, accrue holiday at the rate of 12.7% of the hours work but they are putting in place measures to limit any potential uh, liability. On the other hand, there are employers that are taking the opposite extreme um, stance and they are offering, offering all zero hour workers 28 days holiday calculated at effectively they, their daily holiday uh, pay, which is um, used by averaging a week's uh, pay by uh, five, i.e. the number of standard working days in a week. I think that option is probably commercially unattractive for a, a lot of our, our, our clients, but it is available there. And then there are a number of options in, in the middle, but as I say, those options very much depend on your current working arrangements and, and your appetite to risk. Brilliant. That's a really good answer. Thanks, Anna. Really helpful. So I guess what we're saying is there are these two extreme options. Stick with your 12.07% or pay the full 5.6. And then there's a plethora of different decisions in the middle, depending on your organization's needs, depending on your attitude to risks, etc. And we have produced, get ready for the shameless plug, a holiday rights toolkit some of you will have bought it already and in this toolkit we've set out the various implications of the supreme court decision we've made it plain english we've made it practical and we've put in examples there so please do contact us if you'd like more details of that it's the tool which as you employ people or as you look at your current employees you can assess whether they fall under the supreme court judgment and if they do how you decide to accrue holidays and also we will keep you updated with any changes that we know through our blogs and e-briefs so again if you haven't signed up for those please do and i think that's done with our little bit so as they say in all good recordings back to the studio